Hey everyone, welcome back to another Jazz Drum Q-Tip of the Week. My name is Quincy Davis. I'm jumping right into this thing because we're talking about jazz language, jazz comping language that you need, that you have to learn. It's a language. It's not technique, right? It's not just notes. It's not just rhythms. And it's not just about your independence, though independence is definitely involved. Um, we're talking, we're dealing with the language first, and that'll kind of lead us into the technique, okay? Um, so if you're ready, then I'm ready. Are you guys ready? If you're ready, then you know what to do. One, two, three. Let's go! All right, so we're dealing with jazz comping language. It's a lost art, and if you don't check it out, if you don't listen to it, if you don't study it, if you don't watch the masters doing it, it's not going to get into your playing, and you're not going to sound as authentic uh, as you could. So I am here to help you out with that. I've actually created etudes based on jazz masters language, uh, language from Art Taylor, Philly Joe Jones, Art Blakey, Buddy Rich, Billy Higgins, all the great drummers. Um, I've created etudes based on their language. I think it's a really great way to work on it because it's not technique first. I want to get out, to, out of that mindset of thinking technique and notes and independence first. There's a lot of great books that focus on that, and you can still work on that, but what I wanted to create is something that was language-based. I'll say it again, language-based. So you're hearing and you're playing the language, but you're also working on your independence and all that other fun stuff that you need to be able to execute these things. So um, I'm going to be using these etudes. You can check it out. I'll, I'll put the link down below. Um, you can follow along in this video. I'll, I'll make sure there's a PDF that you can see. But you should check it out. The cool thing is that th these etudes are, this group of etudes is in blues form. So you can use this to play along to any recording of a blues that you have at different tempos. You can also use it to play along to my bass playalongs uh, in blues form. I have two sets of playalongs. One is rhythm changes, one is blues. So you can use these etudes with the blues playalongs. I'm going to play through a couple of these just so you can hear what they sound like. It's just language. It's nothing fancy. Uh, it just sounds good as is. So this is number one from my melodic comping etudes over the blues form. Here we go. One. Two, one, two, three, four. Ah. All right. Going on to number two. So you can hear it. it sounds like I'm just playing, even though you can see I'm, I'm actually reading this. Um, but ideally, it sounds like you're just comping over a blues form. And if I do that with my, my bass play along, again, you can use this with the bass play alongs that I've created or with any recording uh, of a song over blues form. So I'll do it with my bass play along. One, two, one, two, three, four. Right? 
So again, it sounds like language. It is language, right? Um, you'll notice also throughout the whole thing, uh, this first section is mostly eighth notes. And um, the ride cymbal pattern, because this confuses some drummers, even though it's written as one, two, and three, four, and one, we read it often, the way it's interpreted is in triplets. So one, two, a three, four, a one, two, a three. I don't want that to throw you off. Even though it's written like this, we interpret it as triplets. Uh, it's kind of like a, a lazy way of writing uh, the ride cymbal beat. And also, throughout most of this, these etudes, the ride cymbal beat stays stagnant, meaning it doesn't change. So I want you to practice this with that as it's written, with the ride cymbal kind of staying steady and, and consistent, but I also want you to practice it opening up the ride cymbal. So uh, I'll play the first couple lines in number one, and so I'll play it both ways. The first way I'll play it, st stagnant ride, not changing, and then the, the next way, uh, I'll, the next time I'll play it with the ride cymbal kind of interacting with my comping more. So one, two, three, four. Right? So that's with the ride symbol kind of stagnant. Though at the ends of both of those phrases on measure four and eight, I'm anticipating. I want to talk about that in a second. Um, but this is with my ride symbol kind of ever changing and interacting with the comping a bit more. So one, two, three, four. One. Okay, so it doesn't change so much, and there's no method or there's no uh, rule as to what you should and shouldn't do on the ride symbol. It's just a matter of making sure you're um, playing your hands together, right? You're comping together, as opposed to just in the snare drum and the bass drum. Now you're using your ride symbol to comp, so to speak, um, changing up the pattern. Um, and you'll find also you'll start to use more quarter notes. So as opposed to playing. You'll start to do. Right, can you hear the difference? Um, another important thing that you'll see throughout these etudes is the anticipation. Often drummers who are not comfortable with syncopation hit downbeats way too often. There's nothing wrong with downbeats. Downbeats are important and great. Uh, you got to have that one, like James Brown always had it. Give, give it to me, put it on the one, right? But in jazz specifically, uh, or especially, anticipations are very important. <clears throat> and uh, on the ride symbol, when you an anticipate, there's a crash, what we call a shoulder crash or a shoulder shank, right? So my stick is flat, and I just kind of push my tip up more closer to the to the uh, bell of the ride cymbal, and instead of hitting like that, now I'm hitting the whole shaft kind of together in a very even way, and it gives kind of a a, a quick accented crash that gets out of the way of the of the ride beat. So as opposed to you see how much it's kind of too much sound um, especially in an acoustic jazz setting. Not that you can't do that ever, but most of the time if you're trying to keep time and play an accent here and there It's a sound that I use and many drummers use all the time. It's a, kind of a, a more modern, a 
approach to playing the ride cymbal and a, a modern texture timbre to get out of the ride cymbal. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to triplets. Uh, the triplet portion of the etudes, which it gets a little more challenging, but I think you can do it. All right, so now for the triplets. This is etude number 10. I'm going to play it slow. And the triplets in general, um, a lot of these sound better slower than trying to play it fast. It's not about the speed. It's about the language. Here we go. One, two, number 10, two, three, four. Ah. All right, Blakey. All right? I think I missed one note in there, but hopefully you'll forgive me. Um, there it is. It's all in there. Um, it's triplets, but it's not triplet exercise sounding. It's language, triplet language sounding, right? Um, I'm going to skip to, well, I'm going to go to number 11 now, and let's see what that one sounds like. One, two, three, four. Right. All right. So that is this week's lesson. It's all about jazz comping language, not notes, not technique, not independence, but language. If you got the language, then you have everything you need. If you don't have the language, then you don't have everything you need. The language will lead you into the technique and the independence necessary to execute the language. OK, so. With that said, have fun. Check out this, this, these A2s. I think they're going to really help you. Practice them slow. Take your time. There's no rush. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Okay? So until the next time, practice hard, but practice smart. Take care. Bye-bye.